I just wanted to start out by saying thank you so much for coming and being here and sharing your Sunday with us. Uh, my name is Elaine Waterman. I am the executive director here at the Firehouse Art Center. Uh, the Firehouse is a nonprofit art center in the heart of downtown Lamont on 4th and Kaufman, providing life enhancing art experiences through art exhibitions, art education, and cultural events. Our artist talks are casual chats with artists, curators, members of the creative community, and creative entrepreneurs with a focus on how to build community within the arts. Firehouse Artist Talks give the community a chance to ask questions and get to a deeper level with the art on our walls. We are taping this talk and you can find it on our YouTube channel along with our past artist talks and presentations. Our next talk is scheduled for March 26th with Joanna Giddings as we talk about her work Displaced, which is on display now in our upstairs gallery, Studio 64. I wanted to share a couple of updates for the Firehouse Art Center. We have life drawing tomorrow and then on the last Sunday of the month. On Wednesdays, we have yoga in the gallery and Firehouse Songwriters is this Tuesday. We also have our weekly watercolor and acrylics classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Please visit our calendar on the website for more events. I did want to give a shout out to our sponsors, the LDDA, Longmont Creative District, Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, the Longmont Community Foundation, the Community Foundation of Boulder, the Boulder County Arts Alliance, and Colorado Creative Industries. We couldn't connect our community to creative and life-changing art experiences without your help. If you would like to donate to support our programming and our exhibits, please visit our website at firehouseart.org. And lastly, in the spirit of healing, the Firehouse acknowledges and honors the Arapaho tribe, the original people of the land upon which the Firehouse sits. We also wish to acknowledge all other indigenous tribes and nations who call Colorado home. It is because of their hardships and sacrifices that we are able to be here sharing this art with you today. The Firehouse believes that we can only grow when we have a better appreciation for the history, legacy, and contributions that the tribes have made, not just to this region, but to the nation. And about our exhibit, um, Tony Yumele was a Brooklyn-born photographer who experimented with pinhole and in-camera double exposure techniques. His self-portraits, images of Italy, San Francisco, and New York reveal the layers and complexities of being human across culture and across time. He was a founding member of the Muse Gallery and the Longmont Studio Tour. Yumli was struck by an automobile in Longmont last August and passed away from injuries sustained. He was a beloved community member and a regular at the Java Stop Cafe, where he conversed with friends over the New York Times, created art, and also exhibited his photographs. Our community deeply benefited from his adventurous spirit, loving heart, and gregarious personality. I'm so excited to be here today with curators Angela Falloian and Joanne Curtis and longtime friend to Tony, Julie Cardinal. Angela, artist and curator, uh, her paintings reference the biodiversity of her garden. Her work celebrates that which makes us unique, but most importantly, connects us to one another and our surroundings. She has exhibited her work from Colorado to California to Texas, and has completed over 20 solo exhibitions, and was honored as a Colorado creative by Westward Magazine in 2019. Her public art projects include murals for Adams County and the city of Boulder, paintings in Children's Hospital and St. Joseph Hospital in Denver, as well as painting in Sandstone Ranch in Longmont. She has served on the Teachers Advisory Committee for BMOCA and the Visual Arts Committee for the Dairy Center for the Arts. She co-created and facilitated the Boulder County Arts Leadership Forum in 2012. Beloian lives in Longmont, Colorado and is represented by Walker Fine Art in Denver. Joanne Curtis, artist and curator. Joanne has a BFA in photography from Ohio University. After three years of making art, she returned to Ohio State University for her MA in arts policy and administration. 
She moved with her husband, Kyle, to Lamont in July 1999. She was the executive director at the Firehouse Art Center <laughs> from 1999 to 2002. She was also executive director of Artwork, Artwalk Longmont, Longmont Studio Tour Project Manager, and then became the executive director of Arts Longmont in 2017. In 2018, she became the Art Walkway Curator at the Longmont United Hospital. In 2020, she returned to her original calling, which is artist. She is now a ceramic sculptor, happily creating in her home studio. Julie Cardinal is a longtime friend of Tony's. Julie is a fine arts photographer and was the owner of the Darkroom Gallery, which she opened to support fellow fine arts photographers in having a place to showcase their work. Julie states that she has been toting her camera around since she was 10 years old. So I did want to start out um, just kind of getting an idea of how how you met Tony and how Tony became a part of your life. Do you want to sit first? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Have a seat. And just to say again, um, if everyone could put their phones on the silent and vibrate. Yeah, there's. Okay. So, um, yeah, if you guys wanted to share just how you met Tony and how he became a part of your life. Um, I guess I'll start. I met Tony. Uh, I, wow, I was trying to think about it. It's hard to pin down exactly, but um, I know it was before my son was born, which was in 2000. So I think it was the late 90s when we were on the studio tour together when Longmont was first starting a studio tour. And um, there were just a group of artists that were making that happen. And we had recently moved to this area, and Tony was just a very welcoming person. He loved to talk to everybody. <laughs> and um, we just started a friendship. And then <clears throat> when my son was born, my husband and I moved to Rome for a year. And Tony and his wife um, came and visited us. And that's when he took some of these photos mm -hmm. That are up here. So we've just had a really long friendship, and towards the end of his life, um, just after the pandemic, uh, when he stopped driving, we started doing weekly grocery shopping together. And so we saw each other on a weekly basis and had breakfast together and we'd talk about art at the New York Times and um, went to the Penn Posse shows together in Denver. And yeah, he was just a big part of my life. Who was your best friend? Yeah, <laughs> you're making cry. <laughs> um, and, and Anna, actually, can you do me a huge favor? There is a box of tissues. I have made a note. I have made a note to make sure we have tissues available. Um. I, I don't exactly remember where I met Tony either. I think Tony was everywhere, so you know, I could have met him like in multiple locations, even in a day. Um, but I, my first job when I moved to Longmont was here at the firehouse. And so it was in some capacity that I met him um, through this organization. And again, just kind of became friends with Tony and he was just always around and he was um, just there. Like he was so involved in very invested in the artist community and wanting to see the exhibits and not to do a pass through, but to really experience them. And um, being here and then being at the Arts Longmont Gallery for many years, like he just spent a lot of time just in the gallery looking at things. Um, but he just also had this, I just always felt like he was looking out for me. And, um, and there was a couple things that he did throughout our relationship that, you know, it was just kind of like that, you know, Good big brother that was just like, hey, is everything okay? And just that always touched my heart. So, um, and of course, we like to talk about photography. And he had a dark room, and not many people, even in 1999, didn't have dark rooms. Um, and people, you know, then the transition to digital started happening. So I think that was like our instant bond of like, I mean, I call myself a, a snob because I like, you know, I like, I like film and printing and all of that and getting my hands dirty. Um, I never made the digital transition other than taking pictures of my kids. So I think that was kind of a bond for us to talk about the dark room and really talk about the process and all the multiple steps. So I think that was really big for us. You actually gave me one of your old enlargers. I did, I did give you 
<laughs> yeah, I started doing the dark room when I started having kids and couldn't touch all the nasty candles. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the end of it for me. <laughs> well, I had to write mine down, otherwise I would just sit up here and weep. So <laughs> <laughs> as Elaine mentioned, I am the former uh, owner, former owner of the former dark room gallery. Mm -hmm. And it's such an honor to be here to help celebrate Tony's life and work. And I'm also deeply gr grateful to Angela, Joanne, and Elaine for the invitation to speak and for curating this touching and amazing retrospect retrospective of Tony's work. Tony visited the darkroom gallery often, and seeing him walk through the door always felt like a breath of fresh air. Sometimes he would tell me stories about his family and upbringing. Sometimes he was eager to show me his amazing work. But most times, we stood shoulder to shoulder in comfortable silence, admiring the most current darkroom exhibit. It was in those quiet moments of companionship that I felt the deepest connection to Tony. His appreciation for art and his love of photography brought us together, and our shared passions undoubtedly enriched our friendship. Not only, Tony was, not only was Tony a talented photographer, but also a dedicated one. Given his willingness to enter his work in our many darkroom competitions, it's impressive that his work was consistently accepted regardless of who was curating the exhibit. As I mentioned earlier, I knew Tony as a quiet man, but the exhibit openings always brought out a more gregarious side of his personality. <laughs> Perhaps this was because he loved swapping stories with fellow photographers, or maybe it was just all that free-flowing wine. <laughs> Tony not only had a profound impact on my life, but also the lives of so many others in our community. His art spoke volumes and his presence was felt by all who knew him. It's natural for all of us to feel a sense of emptiness in his absence, but I hope today, here together, we can find some solace in the memories we share and the legacy that he left behind. Thank you, Tony, for sharing your amazing photography with us and your amazing soul with this world. <laughs> and I also wanted to, um, at this time, thank his family for sharing the works with us. Um, a couple of these photographs were actually taken from the walls of Tony's home, so um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, to his family for letting us share this work with you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I kind of wanted to talk about, to uh, Joanne and Angela, how did this show come to be? How did, like, you Well, I think it really started at his memorial um, service. The reception was here afterwards, and multiple people came up to me and was like, ah, oh, we've got to do a show of his work. And because Tony was so involved with the firehouse, um, it just kind of made sense. And then Angela and I made up, met up for coffee, and um, she was like, God, we should really, I would love to see his work up. And I was like, yes. Um, so I think everybody was kind of on the same wavelength of, um, you know, it needs to be seen. And, you know, knowing that he had so many different bodies of work, like just to have them in one space all to himself, um, I just, it felt like the thing to do. Like it felt really important. So, and, Oh, I had been to his house so many times to pick him up to go shopping and had never been down into the basement to see where the work was. And when we went down there, it's, it's, a, they're like rooms of just photography equipment and, and prints that haven't ever been framed. And then all of the framed work just in stacks, and I feel like we barely scratched the surface. Mm -hmm. And this was in January, I think, when we started, started January, looking, yeah. and we thought, okay, the, the show is just in a couple months. We kind of need to think about, like, what's the, the path of least resistance? Um, <laughs> but I feel like it could be years going through mm -hmm. and, and cataloging and... You could do another show. Yeah, yeah. oh my gosh, yeah. yes. And um, it... I think we ended up choosing a lot of the pieces that were already framed. And as I look around after we got the show installed, 
it felt to me like Tony had done all the work and he was just mm. waiting. Mm. <laughs> and he had shown some of these pieces before, um, I think at, at uh, Flatirons Acura, and then in Cafe Luna and Java Stop. Uh, but he was so consistent in the way that he framed his work that I feel like when we brought everything together, it felt like this was the show that he was preparing for through yeah. all those years. Mm -hmm. And it just hangs together so well. Mm -hmm. He does a great job. Thank you. Tony did. <laughs> we just moved it. We arranged it. And you kind of just touched a little bit on it, um, you know, as far as having just a huge breadth of work. When we when we walked into, yeah, there were different rooms and there were all these stacks. And I remember we were looking through some of the stuff and we were like, oh, here's a pile of, of mat board. And then we looked at it and we we're like, oh my gosh, it's more, it's mm -hmm. matted photographs. Like it's, it's photographs ready to go. Um, when you were putting together kind of like the, the series of the works, because it seems like you know, there's the, the Italy series and then the um, kind of like the wovens and pinholes and then the self-portraits. Um, how did you like look through his breath of work and figure out what were what were those groupings? I, I was really grateful that he had kept so many things and going through one of the closets, there were some uh, artist statements that he had enlarged and printed and matted on foam board for some of his exhibits. And that really helped us with understanding what, what he printed when and what he was thinking about and how he saw those series grouped. So I feel like in writing the statement and hanging the work, I was referencing those statements, his own words, quite a bit. And I think too, because there was so much work, I mean, we didn't even start into like the negatives, like mm -hmm. the, the file cabinets and like just, right. mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah, I can't imagine how much, how much time it would take to go through that. So I, I think he helped us for sure because of having things framed. I mean, I think the Italy pieces, you know, that's, where he's from, like that made the most sense. Those were the big, you know, the big pieces. Um, and then just kind of working through, looking at all the work. Um, we did come across like, I mean, some early work. So he was originally started as a commercial photographer. Um, so we found many senior portraits, family portraits, I mean, lots and lots of those things. Um, with ribbons. With ribbons. Still yeah. Awards. Oh. Yeah. Oh. yeah. 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 Um, and I actually spoke with somebody, I can't remember, it was just this week, but they were like, oh yeah, he did our family um, portrait. And I, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I can't remember who it was. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, he's been doing this for a long time. Um, we did select on the back wall two pieces that from his earlier, um, earlier work, um, and they were framed differently. Um, one was, we had framed, it was actually just matted. Um, so we really wanted to include kind of like a starting point um, because he didn't just start with Italy. Like there was the amount of time he was photographing and the work he was doing um, was a lot of years, so. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people actually who had come and seen the exhibit already, they were asking me like, did he just do black and white photography? Like is that what, and I was like, no, no, when we went through his work, there was a lot of color, um, but it was more kind of in the beginning. Yeah, you know? yeah. So. Yeah, I think there was definitely a shift, you know. And at the thing, being a photographer myself, like I saw some of these early color pictures and I was like, this is, this is where you start as a photographer. Like, you know, your basic color landscape, like they were really good, but it just, it was, I just thought it was interesting to see that of like, you know, he started out like the rest of us and, you know, started learning how to do it and started in color. And then um, I think that shift into black and white is where you really see him start experimenting and getting away from traditional, you know, standard photography. So during the installation process, did you find it easy to group all the photos? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do they speak to you so. like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think definitely. 
Yeah. And you had kind of touched on this as you're talking about photography work in general, and um, maybe Julie, you can talk about this as well. Uh, what were the, some of the processes that you see Tony using in his body of work? Well, it's all analog, you know, digital. <laughs> yeah. And actually, Joanne was just asking me if I knew, like, on that particular one from Italy, I, I believe it's like a double or triple exposure. So he got, you know, definitely very experimental. And this, you know, looks like a longer exposure. So I think he did go from being just a traditional photographer to a, a true experimental art artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, and, you know, then he also did pinhole work. And this mm -hmm. is his pinhole camera. Um, and uh, there, we didn't find as much of that as we thought we would. Um, and love Tony, but he really didn't mark his work. So if you're an artist, please date and title your work. <laughs> Just saying, for future reference. Um, so yeah, some of them, I mean, there was a lot of, of guessing outside of what he didn't have written about them. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, incorporating the different images um, and... And I don't know if, um, if he, because you can do um, kind of double exposures within the camera, um, or you can also do, you know, once you're printing, start doing double exposure. So I'm not really sure, at, like, which ones, um, where he did double exposure. Some of them seem more obvious than others, but some could be done in the printing process. I think that most of them were done in, in the, the camera. In the oh, printing printing. Printing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he told me he had a camera that he could control. The, the film didn't automatically advance. Yeah. Mm. So he could rewind it. And he had a favorite one. I don't remember the names of them, but he said he left it on a bench once oh. he went back and it was gone. Mm -hmm. I think it was a German camera. Yeah. But he had some that he could, he could control the, the film and he would either rewind it in the camera and then shoot it again, or he wouldn't advance it and he'd take another picture and okay. then he'd advance. Yeah. So mm -hmm. say, sometimes it was totally random and sometimes it was more like, I'm gonna take two pictures in the same location. So there's a mystery in that creation, right? Mm -hmm. Because now when you're doing it with digital photography, there are these apps that you can do on your phone where you're right. like, I'm gonna take double exposures and you can kind of see how they're layering. But when it's in camera, mm -hmm. You don't know. You don't know. Yeah, it's a surprise. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that that was the part of photography for me that changed with digital. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this, you learn a lot about how you shoot the film, how you develop the film, and then how you print. And then there's all these things you can do when you're printing. <laughs> Similar to digital is what people tell me, but I don't believe them. <laughs> um, I mean, there's definitely, you know, a skill involved. And so, like, you take all these pictures and you don't know. You don't know until you get to the dark room, right? And, you know, cross your fingers, you don't over or under develop and all of those things. So I think there's a mystery in it um, in, until you get to get to that final printing process and see if you get what see if you saw. Right, I, and when I, I went to the Art Institute in Denver, which no longer exists, but we started learning, um, we had to start on a large format mm -hmm. camera and so we'd have the dark cloth and, you know, inserting one sheet of film at a time. And you, like John was saying, you don't know yeah. until you until you develop the film. If, if, if you've got anything good for you, you screwed it all up. <laughs> you had to go back and do it again. Yeah. And yeah, it was exciting. I mean, it was like magical to yeah. see the image develop right before your eyes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think his um, medium format camera is in the back. And um, Maureen Rudy Burkhart, who is another photographer, um, couldn't be here today, but sent me some pictures of him out photographing. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's a process. It's you know, there's some setting up the um, tripod, and there's one image of one of the cases, and he's standing on the case, like looking through the camera. And mm -hmm. so, you know, shooting was part of, you know all of the process of just being there and spending the time to do it is not even shooting is not a fast process mm -hmm. 
And uh, Joanne, you kind of mentioned how you feel about digital. Did you have conversations with Tony? Oh, yes. Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's there's just something about it. I, mean, I spent my undergraduate in photography and, you know, putting on a pair of headphones, big headphones with my Walkman, and being in the studio or being in the dark room for hours on end. And, like, you come out and you're like, it's Yes. <laughs> like, they take, yeah, I mean, the hours just go by, and it's just, it, it, it's an experience. Like, I just cannot, and neither of us could translate that to sitting in front of a computer and doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think you got, I mean, he had some frustrations with, he tried doing, not digital photography, but he tried digitizing his work. Mm -hmm. Someone told me he lost yeah. a lot of those mm -hmm. photos, too, that were on mm -hmm. his laptops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it probably was really discouraging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Checking out from doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. But one of the stories that Maureen shared um, so, Maureen, um, like when iPhones were like new on the scene and iPhone photography was like the thing, um, she said that Tony was apprehensive about anything digital, but he wanted to try it. And so he showed up for one of her um, iPhone photography classes with his classic flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> but he was determined to do it, and I have some pictures of that too. She sent me like a hundred, and I edited them down. <laughs> but he wanted to try; like he wanted to see what he could get. And as you'll see from the images, like they're Tony. Like <laughs> he managed to, you know, take it and make it his. But. Um, he didn't know how to get them off his phone, so he had to mm -hmm. give it to her to get them off. And um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I think, you know, he tried, but he was a purist. <laughs> well, I did want to um, leave some time for uh, community sharing and also questions. Uh, but before we move on to that, I just wanted to see if you guys had anything that you know, you wanted to share about any stories about Tony that you wanted to share or anything that came up while putting together the show, um, you know, anything else? I think what stood out to me in hanging a lot of the work is I, I wish that he was here that I could ask him questions mm -hmm. because there is a transition that happens now where I look at his work and I have my own inner monologue that's happening mm. in my own um, interpretation and it's diverging from what mm. Tony's was and I think that's kind of an interesting thing about art is we put our art out in the world and then the people that interact with it have their own stories and I love the ambiguity in Tony's work mm. and that it is open to interpretation and that everybody looking at his self-portraits over here will have their own story that they take from it. Mm -hmm. And just sitting in this room, I, I feel Tony here, and I also feel like the work has its own life mm -hmm. that it carries on. Mm -hmm. I think for me, like being here, um, Installing, like I think there was a moment where I was like, "Well, he should—he'll just be walking through. Like at any moment, he yeah. was going to come in." So I think that was kind of a weird. Um, mm -hmm. But I think I really do believe that he is here too, and I think he would be so happy with this. I know he wishes he could be here, um, but I mean, this is this is what he did, and just being in the presence of his work. And um, I'm super critical of photography and. The thing that I love about his work is there's so many layers to it, and you can go back and look and see something a little bit more each time. Um, if you when you come back to the gallery when nobody's here and the bench is in the middle and just sit and just look at each one, and there's just so much going on. Um, his personality is in every one of them, and um, I think the piece that this piece in the middle, his this portrait, the woven one. Um, I vaguely remember it, but I think it became my favorite from hanging the show, and mm -hmm. it just felt like I was like stepping into like the Tony booth, like, mm -hmm. hey, you know, what's going on? Like, what do you need to tell me? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that kind of became my favorite out of the show because of that. So. Mm -hmm. And you guys were speaking about, um, you know, once your piece goes up on the wall, it is 
you're opening it up for interpretation. And uh, I just kind of wanted to give you guys a chance, the curators for the show, like how is it different curating um, versus creating? And do you kind of, how do you approach curating and, and how does this affect how you would put together a show of your personal work? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I found it much easier to do this, to, to hang Tony's work and to get up here and talk about it, um, to feel grounded and joyful at the opening um, than it is for me to do my own work. Mm -hmm. it's, it's challenging for me to, I, I practice writing and talking about my work, but it doesn't come naturally. And I often feel like I hear myself saying things and I'm like, that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying it. <laughs> and I think that um, having a little distance uh, mm -hmm. to be able to, to look at Tony's work as an artist and to have um, my own interpretation or uh, perception of his work but to also be able to say this is what he said about it, it there's some distance there, and it was much easier for me to um, to put this show together. It, and it helps a lot to really love the person mm -hmm. and to really respect their work. Mm -hmm. I think if I didn't like Tony's photography, this would have been really hard. <laughs> but I love his work, and I think mm -hmm. that um, it deserves to be seen, and I hope that there is there are some permanent homes for it um, moving forward because I, I really think that Tony did um, interesting interesting work. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my perspective is different because I've spent most of my career being curator and just recently returning to art. So I think when I think about a show, like I'm always like wanting to tell a story. So I think that's like why it was very important. Like. You know, this is where I start, and and talking about like being a portrait artist and doing those pieces, um, and you know, and having consistent um, bodies of work that tell. You know, Italy is definitely one story, and the woven work is what another story. So, how all the different stories kind of come together and tell the big picture of who Tony is. Um, so, I think from that perspective, um, it's been a long time since I've done. A show of my own work um, and I'm currently working on my work and I have lots of ideas in my head but you know I haven't been out to the public yet so it's very safe up here <laughs> so I get the like not like having to talk about um, I haven't had to talk about it because it's stuck in my head but yeah I think there's definitely a different perspective of you know we're we're all our own worst critic and so you know when you're hanging your own work you're like what was I thinking <laughs> no. <laughs> no. it was kind of the same for me when I um the darkroom gallery and you know I wanted it to to be a place for other fine art photographers I I'm a fine art photographer but I hardly ever exhibited my own work it was much easier to you know show other people's work and my favorite part of it was arranging the how the pictures they they, they always had a shape whether it was uh, an oval or a cross but I had just basically one big wall and so that was kind of what I was known for was the shape of <laughs> the body of work mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. it was so fun mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. my husband helped me a ton with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On the ladder, off the ladder. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to add that I really enjoyed working with you because I felt like we had different strengths mm -hmm. and we, we we worked well together. And where I felt I was, you know, not meeting a certain expectation for myself, you would come in and I'm like, Joanne's got it. <laughs> and I was so grateful for that. Yeah, it was awesome to work together. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I did want to pass off the community sharing part to Eric Kopchinski, who is our gallery and curatorial assistant. And, um, you know, if anyone has any stories to share, we are just going to keep it to um, three to five minutes. We'll just try to keep you on the clock. At the end of the talk, uh, we'll really quickly clear away all the chairs and we can have uh, a tour of the work mm -hmm. and the space. 
And if you have any questions specific to the pieces, you could ask the curators then. Um, and we also, as we're filming this for our YouTube channel, we will be having um, photographs of all of the work so that uh, if you are coming and watching it again, um, you will have uh, photographic references mm -hmm. as well. So you can um, see what the works that we are talking about. And I'm going to put my computer in the back, and it has um, his um, flip phone photography, so you can oh, have that running along with pictures that Maria took of him photographing mm -hmm. in action. So, so if you wanted to share, just raise your hand. Um, well, actually, do you guys, did you want to share any stories specifically? I no, would love to open it up. Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Let, let, let a chance. Chance. So, and um, you're Yes, totally. Um, I unfortunately didn't have the opportunity to meet Tony. I had not moved back to Longmont yet, so I'm very excited to hear people's stories about him. So if anyone wants to share something, please. I'll go first. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm here. Anyway, so um, I, um, I came on as executive director at the firehouse uh, two weeks basically before we closed for the pandemic. And um, Tony was a volunteer that would come and he was on the calendar every Thursday. He was uh, art sitter every Thursday. And once I, we basically closed down as soon as I started. And so I think I might have gotten a chance to just volunteer with him once. And then that was it. Like it was it, we were closed mm -hmm. and we were done. Um, I had met him before, though, because I, uh, just being in the creative community, I was also working at the Longmont Museum, and I met Tony at a lot of the openings. Um, I met him here at openings, and he always seemed uh, very kind and generous and just funny and just, you know, was kind of just doing the, like, would just walk through the space and people would talk to him, and, and I, I always recognized him and said hi to him, but I never really knew him at that point. Um, once I was executive director here and the place was kind of closed down for quite a bit, uh, he did come in and he would come in and he would sit with the work and he would, um, kind of just inhabit the space and just sit here and be with the work and experience the work. And actually, um, the Saturday before he passed away, he actually came in and did the same thing, um, during the exhibit opening, we had the bench set up because in that specific place right in the center, he came in and he spent like an hour and a half and he was just sitting in the space quietly. And, mm -hmm. and that was, you know, I've seen him, I would see him daily walking mm -hmm. on all the crosswalks and, you know, sometimes he wave. Um, but yeah, he came in and he spent time in the space and, and it was just, it was just the shock when we heard, but it was nice to to know that he came in and said, mm -hmm. um, I knew Tony back in like 2012, probably through, um, through 16. And <clears throat> he was definitely yeah, just the person you saw around town maybe multiple times in a day. But I was here at the firehouse doing the bookkeeping as a volunteer. And, it was a time for the firehouse that it was kind of under scrutiny by the city and possibly going to be absorbed by another organization. And we, the girls who were running it at the time, or the people, um, got grants and did everything. And it just, as someone who's just kind of been here watching um, how everything went, um, Tony was definitely a huge support. Like, I, I don't. I don't know how often he like brought the ice or made sure the chairs were up and things like that, but it felt like he was always there as someone who was just gonna help and um, and then yeah, he was this Java stop regular and it was just so nice to like get my bagel and have someone I knew just sit down and talk to and <laughs> he was just a really great man. So I was so when I saw this, I was like, cool, oh, Tony's doing stuff. And I was like, oh, die. And it just, I couldn't believe it. And I called Jessica, who used to run the firehouse, and she told me that it had been months. And anyway, I just, it just made me so sad. <laughs> <laughs> just learning about it and definitely grieving. But I didn't know him that well. He just was such a great person to ask. Yeah. Uh, 
I met Tony uh, sometime in the early 2000s, about the same time I met you, Joanne, <laughs> when I was helping with another group, helping Gretchen Beale put together LCA House concerts. Mm -hmm. And a group of friends uh, met at the Java Stop regularly, and that's how I met Tony, mm -hmm. I think. And that group went to Sicily, probably about mm -hmm. 2010, and Tony volunteered to come talk to us about Sicily before we went. Mm -hmm. And he told us about his ancestral hometown, and he brought along a photograph of a, a church in his hometown that was one of his double exposures. I was mm -hmm. hoping to see it here, but mm -hmm. I don't. Mm -hmm. And we got mm -hmm. to go to that town wow. and see the church that was in that photograph and, and feel Tony there with us. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a wonderful experience. And I want to congratulate you for picking out this photograph of Tony smiling <laughs> in the brochure. That's just one of his wonderful attributes was that smile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The piece that you see as you walk in here is from Masala, his hometown. The piece on, on this side of the wall. The Parlaria Flore is where you see the image of himself reflected in his own heart. Hmm. <laughs> well, first time I met Tony, um, I, when we just bought the Central Ball Park, and he came in on my father's birthday. July 21st, and my father passed away a few years ago. And he looked so much like my father. Mm -hmm. The white hair and the beard, and I never met him. And I, of course, I didn't say that, and, and he introduced himself, and he would come in often, you know, go to the job stop and come into the store and buy a, some uh, snacks or something. And cold day, he would uh, sit down and um, rest for a little while before heading home and I make him a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. We sit and it was just a nice um, break from my day to sit down and chat with Tony. And I knew nothing about this side of him, his mm -hmm. artwork. We would talk about Italy. I've never been to Brooklyn, but he would talk about um, right there in and, and, uh, Northern California and just just chat, and he would lend me the High Country paper. What's that called? High Country News, something like that. And he was finished with it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just this wonderful, uh, you know, experience of just he would come in and just my day would slow down and chat and so on. And then over time, I knew Angela uh, through um, our kids and her girls school together. And then we found out that we both know Tony, and we were just getting ready for the three of us to meet mm. at Java Stop. And, mm. uh, and then, um, yeah, he's good. Um, anyway, it was it, all the times we just sat and chatted, and I knew nothing mm. about all this. I knew he had the two of us part of the firehouse. But it was, I feel like I'm just starting to get to know him. And I, just thrilled that, that the support um, people have come out you know, with this. This is this wonderful. We yeah, have to honor him this way. So I was really honored. Mm -hmm. you know, so thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I actually knew Tony before I became in the firehouse. I was. Walk by the firehouse and go to Java stop, and Kevin and I would always have our cigarettes, and <laughs> Tony would always tell me like, show him your artwork, and then Tony got me to do my display there, and after that is when I finally came here with Tony to meet a poet, who he wanted us to talk about his poetry matching my paintings, and. He then walked us back to Java Stop and said, I don't expect to see you in two hours. And David and I sat there and talked about our poetry. And then I met to like Jessica and everyone else at the firehouse. So without Tony, I'm not sure if I ever would have shared any of my uh, artwork. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, 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 the similar story. I mean, it seems like we all have a connection to Tony. 
the Java stuff. <laughs> I, I met Tony about 10 years ago at the Java stuff, and we ended up having coffee about once, once a week. Um, I'm a photographer, and he looked at my full body of work graciously one day um, over coffee, and he gave me sound advice for moving forward in, uh, in my own photography experience. Um, and, you know, like he, he would have his bagel with cream cheese and sesame seeds, and I would sit down and have my breakfast sandwich. And we would sit there, and um, our relationship grew to the point where if he didn't see me, he would leave a note at the counter that said, call me. <laughs> and so I, um, I, I have a little strip piece of paper that says, call me, says call me. No. Um, and it's um, just heartwarming. And, and um, I don't know if many of you know, his birthday actually was two days ago. Yeah. And so the, the fact that this show happened in March and that we're here on this weekend, um, it's just so, so heartwarming. And his presence is just so missed at the job itself. I mean, I know he embodies the space all around us all the time. Yeah, he was a spiritual advisor, a photography mentor. Um, and I came out as trans non binary in the middle of um, my and Tommy's relationship mm-hmm. friendship. And he did not miss a beat with mm-hmm. me. He, he embraced me, and someone from that generation to just embrace me and who I am. Yeah, I think he really, I think when I think of him, he had like this quiet presence and then he would start talking and it was just like, you know, like there was just, there was so much there. I mean, if you didn't know him and you just saw him, you and then he started talking. <laughs> and there was just so much there. Like, it was just, you know, yeah. And then just, I think that is like how I think of him. It's just, I can see him walking quietly, you know, with his camera around, strapped across his chest, and, and you know, this quietness to him, and then, and then conversation to him. Does anybody else have anything to share about him? Um, Tony, as you probably know, was a Quaker, and his parents were also, and he was a lo- much loved member of the Boulder Friends uh, meeting, and so he would never let anybody drive him from Longmont. He wouldn't take the bus and be independent. But finally, the last few years, we had a, uh, we set up a thing that we took turns taking him. But the one thing that I remember him saying so clearly is like, you talked about his work, I had no idea. He had all of this, but he said, I said, why don't you do that again? Show it again. Nobody would be interested in seeing it, he said. So it's so nice to see that it's so contradictory that actually many people want to see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you remember the clicker number that I. 226. 227? Yeah, I think seven, there was one out of it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah, that was a total on opening reception. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which was another connection with Tony and I. I was also obsessed with the clicker. Yeah. <laughs> I used to share that passion. Turn towards the door and click. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and actually, um, so Tony came up with the term art sitter, I think is, is what I heard, that he came up with the term art sitter. And so the art sitter is the person who comes and, um, you know, helps in the gallery and is here and is babysitting the artwork. And it was really funny because somebody um, on our board was like, why do we call it art sitter? Why don't we call it like exhibit host? And, you know, it just seems a little bit more official. And I was like, yeah, okay, well, you know, we'll consider that. And then somebody else, you know, came in and said, hey, Tony was like, I was so excited when he would come in and be art sitter, and that was his term, and that's what I was like, oh, okay, so we'll stick with that. <laughs> we'll stick with art sitter. Yeah. It has hearts. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I remember saying I have to art sit today. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I'm probably the only person in here who didn't really know Tony on a personal basis. I would just see him. Yeah, when he was art sitting and various things. But what I hope someone would talk about that I can't really talk about is um, when I moved to Longmont eight years ago, one of the things that made me fall in love with Longmont and, and the firehouse in particular, and I never say this correctly, the coffee shop, 
Oh, Chaka Cha. Yeah. And it's my understanding he was very instrumental in the running of that, which was just magical as far as I was concerned, Scott. I'm forever grateful to Tony for that as well as everything that you all have experienced with him. The Chaka Cha was an event that we had once a month, I think, at the firehouse where you showed you got to be an expert. So anybody could do a pachaka cha, and it was a, a slide exhibit. I think twenty slides in twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. Twenty. Twenty. It was faster. I think it had been like six. It's yeah. twenty mm -hmm. slide, Twenty seconds per slide. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are hoping to bring that back in some of those iterations, some iteration mm -hmm. for first Fridays, because mm -hmm. people would come in and just share some mm -hmm. bit of knowledge that they had, where they were an expert on this, and and I learned so much coming to pachaka cha. Mm -hmm. And the Chaka Cha is Japanese for chit chat. Oh. Mm -hmm. It was great fun. So I really appreciate what he did with that. And I think he got behind a lot of programs like that. And mm -hmm. we came across his um, it was the film festival. He mm -hmm. had one of his um, volunteer film festival name tags hanging in a studio, mm -hmm. and you know he was involved with the studio tour and the Muse Gallery. I mean, he just <clears throat> got involved in anything. I mean, he just was there and looking to see how he could help it be successful and being an advocate and championing things and donating and like the whole spectrum. Like he was just involved. involved yeah. Yeah, building community and connection was really yeah. important to him. We are. Wait, oh, moment. sorry. Go ahead. Here, since it sounds like we're wrapping, could we pick up on Toby's reminder that two days ago is Tony's birthday and sing him happy birthday? <laughs> yes. No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Tony. Happy birthday to you. last words. Um, Joanne is going to be setting up her uh, presentation and it'll be up there on a pedestal. If you wanted to see, are these photographs um, from the, his flip phone? Or? Um, there is a series from his flip phone and then there are some that Maureen took of him while they were out. Um, nice. Yeah. yeah, so that'll be in the back um, and you can view that. We are going to quickly Take all the chairs and put them away so that you guys have space to walk around and actually do the work. And if you have any questions uh, for the curators uh, or any of the guests here, uh, please feel free to ask. I just wanted to say one last thank you to everyone here on this panel. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your stories and for sharing your passion. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone who uh, is joining us today. And um, I hope you have a lovely Sunday. And I'd just like to say thank you to the firehouse yes. for hosting. Yeah. You know, like this is this means a lot and this, you know, he's done a lot, so it was a really nice feedback. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um